Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use. Every comment, hate that makes my feel. Gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. This is a Keep Hammering Collective with Levi Morgan. How yep. are you doing? I'm I'm great, man. Been an awesome day. Oh man, we've made the most of it, haven't we? Yeah. We get one day. You're here in Oregon, getting ready to go elk hunting. Yeah. And we had one day to make it all happen, and we did it. Yeah, it was fun. I wasn't sure it was going to happen because we're both leaving to go hunting, but I'm glad it did. It was it was an incredible day. Oh, well, I mean, being able to shoot with you, and I I just got to say right off the bat, Levi gave me this his jersey that you won worlds in this yep. is that right and i can't tell you how i mean i'm so honored to have this it's like this is such a meaningful gift to me thank you yeah no problem man i just uh i appreciate what you stand for and what you've done for bow hunting and i've been a fan of yours for a long time and so i was like i don't have a lot that i think he would think is cool but i did win the worlds in this jersey and i'll take it see if he see if he wants it oh i can't even <laughs> I mean, I can't even, I can't remember the last gift I got that I was like, you know, you know, when we, when you get as old as me, if you want something, you've bought it. Right. right yeah. So it's just like, I don't want for anything really. Yeah. I feel blessed with everything I have. So to get something like this, that's meaningful. It's like, yeah. it's a special, it's special for me. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, man, that's a, that's a huge honor. But, um, I do want to say, so I put up one video from today mm -hmm. and, and it's not like I only put up the one where it was debatable on who had the closest arrow. <laughs> it was the only one we had on a phone. So it's like, I didn't pick and choose like, you know, cause most of them, if we would have filmed everyone would be Levi spanking me on every target. So it wasn't that you'll have to wait for the show for that. But the only one we had on the phone was the one I put up. Yeah. But you made some good shots today. I mean, it was, you beat me on a few. Like yeah. legit, like what and close. <laughs> but it, we had some great shots and then some I wish I could take back. But at 105 yards on that black bear, I would take either one of those, I think. Me too. Me too. And, you know, um, yeah, it's not like I beat you. It's like you you did something to yourself on those. <laughs> I mean, on the ones where I had anything to do with it, really, you won. So that's, no. how, that's how it worked out. But uh yeah, I mean, it was just a great day of shooting. Um, man, I, I don't, I was nervous because you're the best in the world, right? I'm, I'm, I, as I said, I'm happy Gilmore out there compared to, to a Shooter McGavin. And I hope we got you doing the Shooter. <laughs> shooter. <laughs> Feels so weird to do that. I haven't seen that movie in forever. Yeah, I hope we got that. I hope Tanner got that because that'll be on the lift run shoot for sure. But that is actually, that movie came to life today. It was funny. It was it was great because we got the trigger punching uh, bow hunter against man, just the best ever to ever do it on in, in archery, and uh, it was, you know, I've been practicing where we shot today. Now I can just tell the truth. I've been going out there every single day practicing. <laughs> I, had some, I had some shots, and I'm like, okay. The first time shooting these are going to be hard, right? Yeah. And I thought, okay, I'm I'm setting myself up for, up for success here, and you know my two go tos, you beat me on both of them. The seventy yard downhill on the deer, and then the on the I, I think it's a white tail, and then I I don't know which one it was, but it's seventy yards and eighty yards, but yeah. through a bunch of stuff, and yeah. I'm like, okay, these are mine. No, no, it, honestly, we shot a tough range. Yeah, like it was fun. I love doing that. I like when we're shooting targets and you're thinking if I make a mistake, I'm going to miss the entire thing. So <laughs> yeah. It was a fun day of, of shooting and difficult technical range. The 86 yarder up the hill is the one I remember most. That was a tough one. Yeah. That was a tough one. And you got a 12, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was, that was one of the better shots I made. <laughs> <laughs> that one and the first one on the black bear, probably my two best today. First one. Oh yeah. 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 We got out, So we got out of the truck and I always like just to get out of the truck, no warm up yep. because that's hunting. And I step out and just wherever I'm parked, I shoot at that black bear. And that was, I think it was like 70, right? Yep, 70. Yeah. I was and, like, well, dang, this is a way to start. <laughs> yeah. Get the bow out of the case. And I made a freaking good shot. I'm like, okay, yeah. you had to put your bow together because you were traveling with it. And I'm like, okay, putting your bow together, stepping out of the truck. And then I make a good shot. No, 
you, you got a couple, I left a couple inches to the right and you put it right in there. Yeah. I think that's a good, like the first shot tells you a lot about your equipment mm-hmm. and how, where you're at, like for hunting, because obviously you hunt for days and days. I mean, it could, it's the first shot pretty much of that yeah. day. That's the one that matters. So a lot of times, like in hunting season, that's the one like I'm looking at when I go out and practice that first cold shot. Yeah. And if it's off, I'm like, okay, I got some work to do. Yeah. You know, so. Well, you weren't off today. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> that was so fun. I don't know how many we shot. We probably, it's like, I would say probably 20, right? Yeah. And they're all, there wasn't too many just straight up, straight shots, like 40 or 50 yards. They were all like, I usually shoot way back and make it challenging and yeah it was so fun it was man i could do that every day same and that range is like cool it's just like kind of sheltered but almost like a rainforest feel in there yeah i got to give a shout out to chris stewart he owns that property he owns the dutch brothers here in town the coffee shops and uh he just like you know whenever you want to come out here anytime and i've been shooting that course i mean it's i haven't shot it in years until you know practicing for you basically (laughs) but uh i used to go out there and you know, it's just a bunch of good shooters, good guys that get together and push each other and have fun. And so I got to, you know, I, I'm thankful for him just to let me do whatever I want there. Yeah, that's like I have a range in my house, but that had that like old school club feel. Mm-hmm. And I miss that with the stakes in the ground. Yeah. And I was telling you today, it's kind of funny because I grew up shooting Pisgah bow hunters in North Carolina. Yeah. And so that was like my home club and it was like the best club around. And it was that same in the mountains kind of course. And uh, that's, I still to this day kind of, because I, I do really well on like really hilly mountainous tournaments, mm-hmm. like where it's tough angles and steep. And to, it's all because of where I grew up. Right. Shooting, like shooting side hills, downhill, uphill. I'm, I'm comfortable there. Mm-hmm. But you take guys from flat ground and put them in that environment and it's a total shock. Right. So big shout out to my old club that I don't even know if it's still going. I haven't been there in years, but... It was a, it was a lot of good memories. So today reminded me a lot of that. Yeah, it was, you know, we had, you know, kind of, I don't know, like challenging footing on some of them. Mm -hmm. Some we shot from our knees, sometimes, you know, shooting over limbs, but you're looking under the limb to the target. So yeah, (laughs) it's, it's like a lot like hunting and, uh, um, it was just, man, it was so good. So I was going to say, how does, how does a kid from North Carolina, who grew up, you know, I don't know if you had any advantages or not. It doesn't sound like, sound like you did, but just had a passion for shooting a bow and arrow. How do you get to be the best in the world? That's a good question, man. I mean, I grew up, you know, I, we had struggles, but it wasn't like we were poor. Like my dad was a rock mason, um, never went hungry. I had a great mom and dad that supported it. And then I had a dad that really just demanded excellence and the strive for excellence and discipline um when i was very young and he saw something in me when i was really little six five six years old he was just a bow hunter um started taking me to local shoots i started winning everything at like five and six and then cub class and the kids and everybody was like this kid's good and i'm just i just like shooting an arrow you know so then he takes me to the ibo worlds and i shoot in the youth or the cub division there and tie for first end up getting second, lost on the final arrow or a shoot off arrow. And so he just quit shooting tournaments and just started taking me around and just like was my coach my whole life. And um, so, I mean, it's a tiny little town in the mountains of North Carolina. And there was, you know, it was like this path that I want, I, I had a goal I wanted even as a teenager all the way through my teenage years, but it was like, there was no template to get there. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't, you know, we didn't have a lot of, you know, means to do it. But my mom and dad sacrificed everything for me to go to these tournaments when I was younger and win through the amateur ranks. Um, and then when I turned 18, graduated high school, and I had won a lot of several worlds and shooter of the years as an amateur. But in high school, I quit um, and focused on sports, girls, all the things that are distractions to most high school guys. You yeah. Know? Um, and then after high school, I was like, man, I'm really, I miss it. I'm hungry. I want, I still have this thing burning inside of me that I want to go do. And 
didn't know how to do it then, you know, and then I'm working as a Mason. My dad's a rock Mason. So I'm working for him some, and then on my own, some trying to start my own business and didn't go to college. Um, and then just set out and said, I'm going to go do it. So I was working 60 hours a week as a Mason to pay my way. I had no sponsors, no free gear, no nothing. And, um, the whole year of 2006, I graduated in 05, 2006 was my rookie year. Never even made a top five and struggled big time, you know, Mm -hmm. broke, uh, and me and Samantha were trying to like start a life together. And Mm -hmm. I'm like trying to be a Mason, trying to be a archer, trying to be, you know, a fiance. And it was like, just not great. And so that whole off season, I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. Worked my butt off, um, practicing, practicing, practicing. And um, the first tournament of 2000, I won rookie of the year, but never won a major event or even came close. You were just a and, top 10 type thing? Top 10, I'd be the first guy out of the finals. Just like one little thing. It was like, I know this is what I want to do. Like mm-hmm. I can feel it burning. I know I got what it takes, but I can't figure it out, you mm-hmm. know? And right when I'd get there to win, it was like something would happen and I'd just miss the finals. And so that off season, I'm like, okay, where am I weak? Where am I, where do I suck at this game? Where am I missing it? So I went through that entire off season and just, I mean, every spare second I was working at this craft um, with just this burning desire. To, like how just, were you, like what were you working on? Um, so I took notes big time back then. I was like logging everything. So I would shoot certain targets, certain lighting, certain lanes, certain uh, sunny, rainy, shady, like the terrain, the target, the way it's facing wind. And then I went back and saw, after I was logging this for months and months, I went back and looked and I started to see tendencies that I had and weaknesses on certain scenarios and weaknesses on certain targets. And so I slowly started to fix those because mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm just missing it by this much, you know? And so I started to fix all my weaknesses and still stay strong where I was strong. And then 07 comes around and I'm, I'm excited. I'm like, I'm going to take it, you know? And then the first event comes and it, I'm the first guy out again. Mm. And I'm like, my gosh, you know? And it's like, I'm not making money. I'm, I'm traveling and sacrificing everything. And like, we're broke. And I come home and I'm just defeated and trying to, you know, still do this rock masonry business. And the economy's not doing great, you know? And it's like, what are we going to do? And so I'm leaving to go to the second tournament and Samantha's like, Hey, you, you know how much we have in our account? And I said, no, I haven't checked. She's like, we're negative 700 bucks. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't go. I was like, well, I mean, you know, it's a $1,200 deal to even get there and entry fees and food and like, okay, like that's it. Like God, I think I get it. I'm not supposed to do this. You know, it's my dream. And I'm not going to put my family through this. So I called my dad because I knew it was kind of his dream too for me. And he'd sacrificed so much and my mom. And I said, look, I said, I don't have the money to go. That was a pretty low place, you know? And I'm like, I just wanted you guys to know first that I'm walking away. And, um, my dad was like, look, if you'll go one more time, I'm going to pay your way just one time. He said, just, just go one more. And so I said, okay. I said, I'll find a way to pay you back, but one more time. And he's like, then we can all feel like, okay, like if you want to walk away. And I go to the shoot. And so you talk about pressure. It's like, this is it, right? You're backed in a corner. Everything you've worked for and dreamed of, it's like riding on this event. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I was 19 and... I remember after that, we, we, at the time we could shoot 14. So we shot at 14s today, a little yeah. bit, but we could you play those during the official round. And so a guy named Darren Christianberry who's still this day, one of my best friends. Um, he was the man at the time to mm-hmm. beat. And he hit the first four 14s of the, like a, just the qualifying round. And I mm-hmm. shot tens. So I'm 16 points back after four targets. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm so screwed, yeah. you know, and, but something clicked right there and I lost all fear of like anything. And it was like now or never, bud, like kind of thing. And mm-hmm. so I just started gunning and I, I think I shot at 18, 14s that weekend, hit 16 of them, set a world record that's still never been broken, won the entire event. And I've still never shot that high of a score to this day. Wow. And I mean, it was a crazy feeling of just like God was like, 
okay. Like it almost felt like I had to get to the point where I had given it all that I had. And he was almost showing me like, without me, you ain't doing this, you yeah. know? And so I called my dad we cried together and it was kind of a crazy feeling. Like finally, it's like all that work and all that effort and uh, it paid off. And so that was my first pro win, but I was quitting before I got there. And most people don't know that story. So, wow, that is, I mean, that's amazing. That's where, uh, I mean, but that's why you are who you are. You know I mean? It's, uh, I think a big thing that I noticed in, in what you say and how you carry yourself and what you write is you do, do give glory to God. Yeah. And I think that it falls in line with, it'd be hard for you not to after the way you phrase that and word that and, and I don't know, just how that divine intervention yeah. kind of paved or kind of turn the tide for you essentially ready to quit. And instead you set a world record Yeah, just by, yeah, I mean, it was a weird thing. It's like, and so I've had so many instances like that where I'm like, I don't have it anymore. Not feeling it mm -hmm. this weekend, no way I can win. And it's just like when those moments, it always seems like something clicks and I know it's not me that did it, mm -hmm. you know? And so I've always just felt like, <laughs> why me? Why am I allowed to do this? Cause I don't feel like I'm that good. I don't mm -hmm. feel like I deserve to be the one standing there when the smoke clears, but he's just allowed me to do it so many times. And so that's why I think I'm so quick to give credit to mm -hmm. him because I know deep in my heart that it wasn't me. I did the work, mm -hmm. but it's, a lot of guys do work and a lot of guys are great. And so I'm just very grateful, very thankful to have been able to do, you know, what I've done. And I just was this redneck from the Carolinas that wanted to shoot a bow and had this dream that just still to this day burns, you know, and has never been put out and just love to shoot. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, your journey has been incredible. How, so you were minus 700. What did you win from that tournament? Do you remember? Yeah, I won about 25 grand. Did you? Yeah. And funny story was I went home. So, cause my wife, Samantha was driving this rickety car that like, and she was going to, she was, um, like, a I don't even know what you call it. Not a nurse, but like one of those steps below and she was working her way through nursing school and, and she was driving to work at like 5 AM and the car was like breaking down. And so the first thing we did, I went and bought her a new car and like two weeks in we're broke again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, Oh no. Like, because as a kid where I come from, you win 25 grand. You're like, I'm rich. Yes. Yeah, lot, the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, two weeks later you're broke again. And it was like, Oh man, I got to win again, mm -hmm. you know? And so I was kind of, we were talking today, people are always like that first win's the hardest. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, ah, I don't think so. <laughs> it was always been the next one. That's the hardest because that next win was like, Oh, I got to prove it wasn't a fluke. Right. You know, you, you're this no, nobody kid that just set a world record and you come to the next event, everybody's looking at you. Right. And all of a sudden there's this cloud of expectation that's following you everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I tanked, I shot awful. Mm. Maybe the worst score I've ever shot as a professional in that next event, it was in Texas. And you talk about like a wake up call, like yeah. from high to low. <laughs> Um, but it was funny. I battled back one, the one after that in Augusta and ended up winning shooter of the year in the worlds that year. And so, um, just been a struggle, you know, through the, all that it was, it, but I think even struggling as a kid is what kind of sparked that dream mm -hmm. for me. Um, I think if everything would have kind of been handed to me, there would have been nothing to dream about. And so I always just dreamed of doing something cool like that and felt it inside and so to, to do that, that, that year in 07 was like, it was like probably the best year ever for mm -hmm. me shooting. Yeah. Who, who was, who'd you look up to at that time in archery? Uh, Randy Ulmer, Jeff Hopkins, Darren Christenberry. Um, they were just the top, you know, Tim Gillingham, mm -hmm. uh, Danny McCarthy was really young at the time too. He was in his early twenties, but he was shooting really well. And Danny and me are still it's like the rivalry, but we're good friends too. But he's, he's, uh, just an unbelievable shot. But like my heroes were Randy Ulmer and Jeff Hopkins growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, Jeff is the one that held all the records whenever I started. And that's kind of who I was chasing at the time. You know, and did you get them all? Yeah. In 3d, I got them all, <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny. And I, you know, Jeff, we're good friends now, but we were not good friends for a while. Um, we had some, 
ups and downs because, I mean, we're both competitors, I think, and he saw this dumb kid just that he, you know, felt was just where'd he come from, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, and I just remember a day in Augusta, that Augusta shoot that I won in 07, I got peered with him and um, we're, we're shooting and he had me quite, quite a bit. I think it was like the bottom of the peer group, but I'd made that top peer group. And by target four, I had caught him on the final day and I was just on a roll and I just couldn't miss. One of those days, it was just like, couldn't do anything wrong. It was yeah. like 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. And he was frustrated and this kid just passed him. And But that's my hero at the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I was like trying to ease the tension. And I'm like, hey man, like it's, it's crazy what you've done, you know, and it's winning seven shooter of the years in a row. Nobody's ever done that. And he goes, he looks me right in the eyes and goes, and nobody will ever do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like melted into my seat like oh yeah but at that moment I was like maybe not but I just dedicated my whole life to it you yeah. know so it lit a fire under me for sure right there and what what were you at I won 12 in a row <laughs> yeah and wow. so you know those years to tie him was a rough year because mm -hmm. it was a big mental barrier because it was kind of like you work you win one shoot of the year two three four no no big deal really i mean it is but it's like yeah. but you get six and you're like okay he said i wouldn't do it yeah then you get to seven and then you get to those last few arrows and it's tight and you're like seven years of work is riding on this shot right and it was heavy I bet. and then i did it and then the next year to beat his record was even heavier mm -hmm. it was like that final I'll never forget that final i could take you back to the tree i was standing next to in columbus georgia whenever i did that but just some of those moments that were really, really heavy over the years stand out big time, you know. And people telling me I wouldn't do things have always kind of been the motivation, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And I, I learned one thing. I'll never tell a 19-year-old kid what he's not going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson learned. <laughs> yeah. So did he say anything to you after you want passed him? No, not really. Still to this day, we've never really talked about it. Mm. We can, but... Um, He's still a legend in my mind. I'm still a huge Jeff fan. Yeah. Um, he's still out there just crushing it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, no, we have, we, we get along great now. You know, mm -hmm. it was just those years as a competitor and it's your life and everything you've worked for. Obviously, it's hard when you see somebody coming and it's hard, you know, frustrating when you don't know how to beat them. Yeah. And I've been there with McCarthy and some of these other kids. It's not, at times, it's like, I don't know how to beat them. Mm hmm. And you can be at your best and still not win, and it's a frustrating feeling. So I'm not, I don't hold any hard feelings towards towards him at, at all. We we get along great. He's a good guy, and we can laugh about it now. Yeah, man, incredible stories. Well, how have you changed from that that kid who won the first one and you got shooter of the year, even that year, to to now? I mean, is the routine the same? Is the strategies the same, or what's changed? No, Just, routine's definitely not not the same because I had no kids then. I got four now. Um, I had nothing else but shooting then. So that's mm. all I did. And it was like just this every day of just that's all I did because I quit my masonry business when I started winning. And um, just that was all this, just shooting. And I obviously hunted because I loved it. Did, did but, you hunt your whole life? Yeah. Or when mm -hmm. did you? Okay. That's kind of how me and dad hunted together. Um, and still do, and my brother. So it was, that's kind of how I got started. Mm -hmm. And it's always been what I loved. Archery is another love, but it's like so different. But um, now it's more strategy. Like I feel like I have to outsmart people because I don't have the time to prepare like I used to. But what I do is so strategy-based that I can still compete by, I feel like by outsmarting. How so? So when we're on a range, like today we were shooting, say we had no range finders. Mm -hmm. And then in ASA, the 12 is in the bottom corner mm -hmm. of the 10. And so if you shoot low, you're an eight. And so it's kind of a risk reward type thing. Do I shoot a safe 10, which for people listening don't know, it's kind of like a 10 would be like par in golf. Mm -hmm. um, a, a 12 would be like a birdie. And so an eight would be like a bogey. And so it's like, where do I, where do I take my risks? Because then they took the 14 away, like a year after I won oh. in 07. So we didn't have that anymore. So we had 12s and we had to play that game. And so it's, um, you have to strategize in that game, especially when you don't have a range finder, because I'm having to judge and guess distance. And it's like, if it's all about minimizing mistakes, playing the 10 ring, giving yourself a chance to shoot 12s and getting on that streak at some point where you get four or five, six in a row, 
that boost you into the finals and then mm-hmm. you make a run in the finals to win. And so that's kind of the strategy. Tons of guys I watch out there that I shoot with are amazing archers and they have the ability and they'll shoot and get on this roll and they see themselves going up the leaderboard and they just slam on the brakes because they're like want to protect get conservative yeah they get conservative way too fast and then it's like boom 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 you pass them and they just just Mm -hmm. miss it and so that's what i did my rookie year and so when i lost brakes (laughs) is when i started winning it was Mm. like no brakes we don't play conservative we're 12 and everything. And, but it's kind of like you do that, but at the same time, you're being smart about how you play that. But once you get to 12, 14 up, or which would in golf would be like under, you, you most guys are like, I need to protect this and, mm-hmm. and take it into the finals where I'm like, I want to get such a big lead here. They can't catch me in the finals. Mm-hmm. And that's really the mindset. I think that's one more tournament for me than anything. And it's aggressive. It's aggressive. Yeah. yeah. And they kind of laugh at me because they like, if I go into the finals and I'm behind, they're like, Ricky Bobby today, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, we're either going to win or wreck the car trying, you know? Right. It's like, and that's just kind of the way I've attacked it, especially now that I can't practice as much. Um, but yeah. So if a deer is 45 mm-hmm. and you got the heart, lung, what, 10, 12, and then the eight, um, how, and you judge it at 45, how would you shoot that? Okay. To get the to top of the 12, give you a chance. But yeah, tell me about okay, that. Okay. So 12 rings, bottom of the 10. Mm-hmm. If I think it's 40, and it's obviously situational. Like mm-hmm. if I got to hit it to make it or to win, yeah. that changes a little bit. But if I'm just like a normal shot in a qualifying round and I'm shooting well, like say I want to 12 it, but I just want to play a good play. If I think it's 45 and I'm aiming at the lower, if it's 46 and I aim at it, I'm an eight because I'm going to hit that far under it. So. Mm-hmm. A yard at 40 is about an inch. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm off three yards, that's a big miss. So what I do, since the 12 is in the bottom, I play that rise game. So if I think it's 45, I'll probably shoot it for 46, something like that, aim at the lower. And if it's six, I'll 12 it. If it's five, I might clip the top of it, but I'll be a 10. If it's four, I'll be a 10. So I try to give myself a window of yardages that it could be. Mm-hmm. Like the closest it could be is three. The furthest it could be is six. So let's shoot it for, you know, just a good play at the lower, protect the 10 ring, yeah. not give any back. If I had to hit it, I'm just going to roll. Um, and it was a kind of Dan McCarthy told me this other day, which is a good way to look at it. He's like, if I have to hit it to win, I'm shooting it like it's a 14 because mm-hmm. the 14 is up yeah. in the eight and five. There's right. no safe play. Right. And so he's like, all I see is the 12 when I'm, I have to hit it. So mm-hmm. there's no guarding tens. There's no, because you subconsciously do that. Yeah. Um, so that's a good way to look at it. You know, mm-hmm. I would just shoot it for straight what I think it's going to take to hit it. If I miss, I had to, I had to hit it anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's interesting. It's, and so for judging, how do you judge? I mean, what's your strategy for judging yardage? Cause if people don't know, I mean, you see a target out there at 45 yards, you say you can be basically one yard off mm-hmm. and that's an inch. And that 12 is how big is that 12? Maybe an inch and a half. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, people don't know who don't aren't archers, but judging yardage to the yard at, you know, half a football field. Not easy. Not easy. So not how easy. do you do it? Yeah. That's kind of the art too, to what we do. We have to be great shots, but we also have to judge great and, and make good decisions is what I tell people. Yeah. But how I judge is, you know, growing up, all I had was a deer tar or um, a bedded buck target and a bag target in mm-hmm. my front yard where I didn't mm-hmm. have a range. You know, everybody thought I was just blessed with this 40 target pristine range. Must be nice. Must be nice. Yeah. Yeah. But I wasn't. I had a bag target that was shot up. Uh-huh. And um, my dad would get old rags from a, a clothing place and stuff it and chicken mesh and, you know, mm-hmm. but it sat at 30 yards in my yard. And so I would shoot that all day as a kid and so still to this day i can find 30 yards like mm-hmm. like i call it my absolute and so that's what i really rely on pretty heavy is no matter the situation i'm like i can find 30 i just close my eyes and then i'll take all the trees away take everything away just me and the target and i'm like where would my bedded buck be in mm-hmm. the yard as a kid and it's like boom right there that's 30. you visualize that you visualize same target that. yep i think we all can agree no one likes a plumber's crack. My suggestion, Groove Life belts 
and longer shirts. But not only does Groove Life have belts, they have silicone rings, watch bands, and wallets for everyday use. I've been using their belts for over a year now, and I can tell you they're easy to adjust and my crack is covered. Go to GrooveLife.com backslash cam and use code cam for 20% off your order. Hey guys, you want to be as smart as famed neuroscientist Andrew Huberman, PhD at Stanford? Well, sadly, that's probably not going to happen. But I did find something that can help, and that's HVMN Ketone IQ. I actually downed one right before reading this, so if I sound decent, it's probably why. Because I'm not sure if you guys realize how much brain power podcasting takes. But whatever I can take that will at least make me sound smarter, I'm in. Ketone IQ is a clean energy boost without sugar or caffeine. Ketone IQ increases your blood ketones. I'm not on a keto diet, but by taking Ketone IQ, I can achieve the desired focus and energy for explosive workouts that ketones typically provide to those in ketosis. You can find Ketone IQ at your local Sprouts or online at hvmn.com. Use code CAM. C-A-M, for 20% off your first order. From there, it's depth perception. I'm listening to my competitors' arrows because we're all shooting about the same speed. And so from the time the bow fires to the time it takes to hit the target is the same for most of us at 40, 45, 50. Mm -hmm. And so if you know what that sounds like and you're not up first, you're listening to arrows. And so I'm going, like maybe I'm thinking, I'm looking at it, maybe 42, 43, and they shoot. And I'm like, oh, it sounds more like 45, 46. Mm -hmm. So it just make, keeps me from making huge mistakes like that. And then I'm looking, you know, gr I'm taking ground, so 30, then I'm walking it back to the target. Um, and you just use everything around you. Arrow holes in the target, what are other people doing, tendencies. You look and everybody's shooting this thing high. It must look further than it is. Yeah. Um, so you just use everything around you to make a good decision. It's not like this. Everybody thinks I just walk up and go, oh, that's 49 and a half. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, no. Yeah. I'm like, could be 46, could be 50. Now let's use everything I can see and hear and 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 find to narrow that window and make a great decision here. Mm -hmm. And that's more how we judge distance. Some days that it's really clicking, you look at it and it's like, boom, you know. it's just coming to you. But those days aren't. And is there shooters that you're with that you know if they hit a touch high, you trust, you know what they're probably thinking, and so then you take a yard off? Yeah, you're dead on. Like, And there's not many, mm -hmm. but there are a few, like McCarthy, and some of these guys I know are making incredible shots, and we think a lot alike. And so in those moments, like they'll shoot a five or something crazy, and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, what am I not seeing? Mm-hmm. You know, instantly I go there. But some of a lot of the guys, you know, you try because I've been I've been burned by that too. It's like okay, it must be way further, and then boom, you go the other way. You know, <laughs> yeah. like I had it the whole time. Yeah. Um, but some of the guys, for sure, I'm like, if they hit bad, I'm instantly like, okay, where did where did? Because obviously something looks mm -hmm. throwing them off. They can't. There's a ditch they can't see, or you know, the lighting. Because like a bright target looks way closer. Mm -hmm sun hit like if you're in a dark tunnel but the sun's hitting the target it's like boom i can see so much detail your subconscious perceives that as it must be closer, closer. Mm -hmm. and so you have to like that when i was saying my rookie off season i was taking all these notes that's what i was learning about myself mm -hmm. like oh the target was bright i underjudged every one of those by two yards mm -hmm. so now i've learned that if that's the case i'm like i need to add because it's i'm perceiving it as closer than it is right and so right. All those tiny little details are why not many people are trying to learn how to judge yardage now. So, yeah, it's uh, you know, I had a few shots today that I was asking you about. I mean, what that little elk that we shot at, we saw a bunch of holes in the log above it mm -hmm. and broken arrows. And maybe it's because of the size of the target, it looks like a, a bull elk, but it's tiny, yeah, right, for sure. So, and if they're judging that, yeah, most people are going to shoot in that log above it, yeah, definitely. And then there's another one what I had been dying to ask you about, but it's a downhill at the antelope at 100 yards, and the sun is always coming in from right to left. And I was always hitting to the left, and then you said that it's probably the way that sun is hitting that peep, mm -hmm. or the light's hitting that peep, and it's making it, giving it like it's twisted almost, and so you're, you're shooting off a little bit. Right. And I had never thought about that. So I'd been dying to ask you some of that stuff because 
on some of these shots, I just kept consistently being two inches off, mm -hmm. three inches off. But yeah, we see that a lot, you know, it's little bitty things and people just, um, kind of chalk it up to, I must've made a bad shot, but a mm -hmm. lot of times, you know, and today it was a good test cause there was no wind. And, and so if that's the case and all of a sudden you turn a corner and start shooting left or right, normally it's the way that lights refracting off your, your peep and your housing. And so you're not centering it the same as you normally do. And it's throwing it off left and right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we've dealt with that at tournaments cause we have to turn corners. Like we shoot down one side, turn a corner. And, and every time we do that, we're all like, <laughs> please be in the middle, you know, and you fire a good one. Sometimes it is. And sometimes if that sun's hitting you hard, and you see us a lot of times with umbrellas. Yeah. Like for shade. And that's what we're trying to avoid. I saw people talking shit about you for oh, that before. Dude. It's <laughs> like, oh, I could shoot good too if I had an umbrella holder all the time. I'm like, man. It's it's uh but yeah, we um might be a little pre Madonna ish, but we are holding umbrellas sometimes shading just to kind of guard against that. Yeah. So Yeah. It's uh it's it's funny. I mean, we get we've got a lot of shit talkers out there, you know. <laughs> Yeah. But you put yourself out there and I guess that's the that's the way it goes. Um but yeah, I mean it's I mean it's fascinating hearing these stories about the tournaments just because it's it's you know, I've shot a bow for my, you know, for 35 years now, but I've that's a different world mm -hmm. than what I do. You know, I'm I'm uh I'm just a hunter, but I love that hunting is your passion also. You just have this incredible talent to be the best in the world at shooting a bow. Um and it's, it's crazy to, I mean, the life you've created, the brand you've made with Levi Morgan, um, and I see, see what you've built, you know, with your family, with your home, with, you know, like I said, the brand of Levi Morgan. And it's like, I, I mean, I love it. It's inspiring to me because to see somebody to take a passion like that you have and turn it into this, it's a giant thing really, because... I don't imagine you could ever have envisioned this. No, no. Like if you'd have told me, or if you could have let like 10 year old Levi see into the future, I would have passed out, you know, because it was like, I just shot a bow cause I loved it. Yeah. I just happened to be like, do it a lot. Love it so much that I just was obsessed with it and did it and wanted to learn every little piece of it. And so, yeah, I've been like incredibly blessed and, and, I think people that are good at what they do can never be really satisfied. And they're mm -hmm. just like, ah, oh, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. And so I also have a little bit of that, which I feel guilty about sometimes because I'm like, God, you've given me way more than I deserve, you know? And it's not that I don't think I'm getting what I deserve. It's just like, I can do better, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. But no, like what we've been able to do and what God's allowed me to do is like above and beyond what, you know, I could have ever expected as a kid or even, even 10 years ago, you know? Yeah. I remember the first year we won, I won a hundred thousand dollars shooting a bow. I was like, this is insane to me, you know, that you can do this with this Seems crazy. stick and string. And it was, it was, um, but it's kind of been, and, and you and guys like you have kind of paved that way and showed that it's, it's, there's no limits. You know what I'm saying? You mm -hmm. just, if you're willing to do things that nobody else is willing to do and just grind and, and go and be positive and just crush things. And that's kind of the mentality I've taken to this game is just like, how long can we do it? Mm -hmm. You know? And I don't know, that might be the last world championship Jersey <laughs> Levi ever had. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, well uh, I have it now. So. Yeah. You have it now. So, uh, but you're it's not getting them back. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I was curious about this too, because I see, you know, I see you with the big checks, yeah. right? I mean, hunting doesn't have that in no. it, and it shouldn't really. But to me, it feels different. But, you know, if somebody knew what you made, it, it's, you know, we're not going to, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you want to say it, but I'm not going to, but I'm no. going to say it's like a, almost like a professional athlete type contract, right? Yeah. How much of that money would you say is because of what you do on the target range or what you do hunting? What's more would, valuable to these sponsors? You know, it's kind of weird now because it's almost like if I win another one next year, and we kind of talked about that, it doesn't feel like it's going to change a lot, but I do feel like the credibility that I, I have created, I think, I don't even know that's kind of a weird way to put it, but with the tournament side of things, um, the longevity there has really 
allow me to establish relationships with companies. So I would say that it's probably heavier towards the shooting side, mm -hmm. but pretty close because the hunting brand that I wanted to build um, has, and, you know, kind of Levi, I don't want to talk about myself in third person because that's weird, but my side on hunting um, has grown a lot and that's because that's what I love, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like I'd survive tournament season now to get to hunting season. Yeah. Right. And it's a job. Tournaments are a job because of the expectation. But I would say that the money we make is split pretty close. Is it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And now it's more of a brand of like who we are and like what we do every day. Um, and so I think, I don't know what it would look like if I walked away from tournaments, to be honest. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, you know, and there is no formula for this. Right. You know, I mean, what you do is different than what I do. But from the outside in, people say, oh, well, they're successful archers, essentially. Right, yeah. But it's like nine day different. Yeah, it's shooting a bow and arrow. But so I was, I was just curious about that because uh, I think what I take away from it is there is no blueprint. It's like you go out there as you know, when I think of Levi Morgan, I'm like, this is an outlier, somebody who's doing things that's never been done. That's valuable. Yeah, that's valuable to whoever he's associated with. So I see it as. Yeah, I was just I was just curious about curious about your perspective on that. Yeah, I would love to. I want to start transitioning more and do like you've been very good at how you built your brand um, and like people love and follow and want to see what you're doing every day. And so, like, we have started to kind of move into that digital space too because what I've done for so long has just been grinded out. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like we had our hunting show. Micah kind of handled all that. My brother. Um, and I just went hunting. He followed me around. He did filming production, everything companies we worked with were there. And then I just grinded it out in tournaments, shooting 15 to 18 majors a year, just grinding. And so I'd done that for so long and poured my life into it that now I'm like, I think we need to go kind of more towards like, let's let people more into our lives. Mm -hmm. And so we have, we're getting ready to launch a brand, um, that's more along those lines of just like, um, the podcast world and, and, um, doing a lot more YouTube stuff and teaching people how to do, how to shoot and, and how to be better at this thing that I love and that I've learned my whole life. Um, and so that's going to be fun and interesting and we're going to have to learn a lot, but, uh, we're excited to kind of go down that road. Yeah. I mean, I think you're set up perfectly for it because what other archer has the, the accolades you do? I yeah. mean, there is, there is none. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say it. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's some people who pretend like they do. Oh, there's there is a couple of those for sure. Um, uh, but yeah, and, and especially in the 3D world, I mean, I don't do the FIDA a lot, the World Cup stuff mm -hmm. overseas. Um, but there's some incredible archers in the world. Um, but yeah, I've been very blessed to win probably more than anybody, I guess, in the 3D side of it. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I don't want to just waste that. And, no, you know, people want to learn and. Yeah. And what I'm fascinated about is your mindset because those details you talk about and that the strategy and it's like that, you know, I think we're, I mean, we put on a little dog and pony show at the bow rack today and everybody wants to see you shoot. Yeah. Right. And, uh, of course at 40 yards on, on Wayne's range there at the bow rack, you shot incredible, but, uh, he was talking about, you know, your tuning mm -hmm. and you said that you, your tuning strategy was different than most people. So I just think that with this brand and like your success and lo the longevity of being on top, it's like, to me, yeah, you've won 14. If you win 18, what is, that doesn't do much. No. You know what I mean? But if you had four years of letting people into your mind mm -hmm. and, and your mindset of how, how to get to the top, right? that's valuable. That's like, you know, like this lift, run, shoot thing we did, this little Levi Morgan experience you mm -hmm. could do and have people in and spend time with them or the podcast. I love the looks of your podcast, the clips you showed me. And it's, uh, I want to hear more about your that that vision you have for that. What's that called? Yeah, it's so it's kind of a funny story. Like I got this um, nickname back in my early 20s called The Manimal. And I always just laughed at it. Yeah. You know? But then I'm like, I would never call myself The Manimal, <laughs> yeah. right? 
But it would, and I even where Greg Poole guy we both know sent yeah. me this custom quiver, angel I love quiver. Greg. Yeah, he's awesome. <laughs> he is. <laughs> <laughs> he sent me this custom quiver that says the manimal. I still mm-hmm. have. I have it hanging in my podcast room. Um, but I never really thought much about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but he he called me that because of just the way I attacked those tournaments and just when I lost all breaks and it was just like all I could see was one thing. Mm-hmm. And it was just this attacking that moment. And I never got crushed by those heavy moments because I expected to be there, I think. Yeah. And I had, I prepared for it. And so like, I wasn't trying to guard second or third place. So I never, once I, when I was in third, I wasn't nervous or second, I wasn't nervous. I was just one thing on my mind. And Mm so, and I'm like, now I'm like, okay, that was kind of a mindset thing all those years. And I'm very intrigued by like, you're the way you do things and the keep hammering stuff. And just that mental toughness. And my dad was an unbelievable coach at that as a young age. And he really just, then it was kind of miserable as a kid, some of the things I had to go through shooting, but it really prepared me for those moments just Mm -hmm. to be strong mentally and nothing was getting in my head. And it's almost like this idea. And I tell my kid too now of, um, cause he plays baseball and he's good at it, but I'm working more of, he's getting ready to turn 11, but I'm working more with him on the mental side than anything. Cause I'm like, if you can't handle it here, yeah, you're never going to do anything, right? And I've seen so many talented people get crushed because they can't they have no mental strength. right? And so I'm like, you got to have the key to that. And you can't let anybody else in there. Like you own that. And so like this Manimal name had kind of turned into this brand that we're creating called Manimal Mindset, which is the name of the podcast. And really what I want to do is just learn and mm-hmm. dig and compare and see other guys and girls that have just crushed at what they do mm-hmm. and just are the best at what they do and how they handle those big moments. And, um, there's a lot of similarities that we're finding mentally, right. That, um, I think people can learn a ton from, and no matter what they do, being a dad, um, being in relationships, um, sports at work, whatever it is they do, it's very, a lot of similarities of how to attack life and how to attack moments that would be really heavy otherwise. And how to stand there when everybody else is going away Mm -hmm. and just totally kill what you're trying to do. Um, And that's kind of the idea behind Manimal Mindset. Mm -hmm. It'll be, you know, the Levi Morgan brand, LeviMorgan.com, ManimalMindset.com, all the same place. So we want to do apparel, podcast, a lot of learning stuff, teach people from, teach people from the mental side to technical archery, but also let them into our hunting side because we laugh and have fun it's not all yeah you know be a beast and kill it you know it's like (laughs) let's go laugh and have a we laughed a ton today yeah we did you know and that's what i love i mean i I love every part we're very blessed to do what we get to do well i said that today too it's like we you know there's some frustrations in what we do i mean there always is because you know everybody's got an opinion on it and and so, yeah, I can get whatever. But at the end of the day, I did say, I go, can you believe we're, what we're doing? That This is work. Yeah. We're, we're getting paid for this. And yeah. It seems crazy. It does seem crazy, man. It was a really cool day for me because I've watched and, and I've just been like that. That's a cool thing. And today, I think it hit me about halfway up Pisgah. I was gassed (laughs) that I was trying to tell stories so we could walk, but (laughs) I just, it was raining and it was just foggy and it was everything I had hoped. Like it was tough. Um, but we get to that top and I've watched you jump up on that so many times. It was cool to do that. It was just a really cool day for me, but I think, um, I was grateful for moments like today, you know, Mm -hmm. and, um, it's easy to get frustrated and especially when you're so passionate. About, yeah. about hunting or whatever it is you do. And, and there's things that like, if you don't, if you're not careful, you can get stuck in this, just being mad all the time. I yeah. feel like the world just doesn't appreciate anything, and mm-hmm. but it, you know, I've always been able to feel like God's always kind of brought me back down and been like, Hey, like, it's pretty awesome. To, it's a pretty awesome day. Huh? You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm the, I've got the, I don't know if anybody could have a bigger chip on their shoulder than I do. But <laughs> that being said, today, I did say when we were watching you shoot, I told Wayne, I said, can you believe we got the best shooter in the world in the boat rack? And so to me, it felt a little bit surreal that we go walking in there and, you know, we're Wayne has that old picture or old, old poster up of yeah. all these like legendary shooters. Yeah. Right. And he's always referencing it. And then we have the greatest of all time 
standing there shooting until, you know, I've been going to the bow rack since I showed you that license I bought in 1989, yeah. my first elk tag from the bow rack. Yeah. 89. <laughs> that was a while ago. Yeah. I've been going to the bow rack for that long. Right. That place is awesome. And, but to see the, the greatest to ever do it in there and Wayne still owns a bow rack, I'm still doing what I do, but we have you there and, and it's like, it's kind of a, uh, you know, a, I don't know, you know, we're looking at, we're, Acknowledging the past with that poster. Who was on the poster? Do you remember? Yeah, I know. Jeff uh, I remember, Hopkins. No, it was Nathan Brooks, Eric Griggs, Bobby Ketcher. Uh, and I don't know. I can't remember the other one. And they're going to hate me for that. Um, but it was the old PSE poster, I think. But it was, it's um, that was it, poster. Or Hoyt, was it? Maybe it was a Hoyt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe it was a Hoyt poster. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it was like this old school poster. And I, we were talking about Nathan Brooks today. Mm -hmm. And Wayne was like, I love watching him shoot. And I was like, still my all-time favorite guy to watch because of how easy it is for him yeah. and it's funny that he references that poster all the time. <laughs> all, almost every guest we've had we will he'll like say look at these guys yeah and uh but so to me you know yeah i'm old you know kind of uh cranky sometimes <laughs> but i don't i can't lose sight of the fact that you know of the moment what the moment meant yeah and uh you know, as a bow hunter and an archer and, you know, the bow rack is, that was like my local bar, you know, instead of going to the bar, I'd go to the bow rack yep. and sit there and BS and tell stories <laughs> and shoot bows and shoot techno hunt and, you know, and shoot for pop, you know, oh, it, yeah. or a dollar, you yeah. know, make best arrow. It's like what I've done my whole life. So it was, it was pretty crazy to have, like I said, the greatest of all time in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Insane. Yeah, it was, um, it was a cool experience for me too. Like Wayne's a legend in my mind, mm -hmm. you know? And so I've watched all his stuff. Like when I was going to Kodiak to deer hunt, I'm watching Wayne's videos, yeah. you know, like how does he do this with the decoys and stuff? So, um, it was cool to meet all them and just kind of be a part of that today. I, I mean, that shop is like awesome. I mean, how lucky to have a shop like that this close mile from my house. I mean, my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just destiny. <laughs> yeah, it is because, you know, I, I was, those guys are so good at working on bows mm -hmm. and people say, well, what, you know, how come you don't work on your own, own bow? I'm like, why? Yeah. <laughs> These guys do it every day, all day. I mean, they'll, and that's one reason I've been as sick, you know, some guys have to overcome their bow first mm -hmm. and I, my bow is performing at its best. So I don't have to overcome that before I can right. kill something, yeah. you know, it's set up right. Cause there's guys who will buy the exact same setup I have right here or that you have exact, mm -hmm. everything exactly the same and it won't shoot for anything cause right. it's not set up correctly or it's not tuned right or that or whatever. So that's a huge advantage right there. For sure. And a lot of guys are two, three hours from the closest shop mm -hmm. and it may not even be a good one, Yeah, you know? And so the knowledge Wayne has there is like, he probably doesn't even think about it. He's building these bows and sending them out. But it's like, man, somebody that didn't know that, that went and watched YouTube, it would take them weeks to try to fine tune that stuff. So it is a big hurdle for some guys that just don't have that ability to go to a great shop. And, and I always, I am a big fan of people knowing their equipment, like, mm -hmm. especially if we're what you do and I do, and we're in the middle of nowhere and yeah. something goes wrong. I think it's important to know that, but yeah, you're, it's, you're lucky to have <laughs> that right here. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, I, I know when my bow is, is something is a little bit funky yeah. and uh, I can definitely tell cause I shoot it so much. And I had a little, little thing, um, before that Idaho hunt I just did where my string stretched a little bit and I started hitting a, just like an inch or two low. And I was like, I know something's up mm -hmm. and the cams are out of time and, you know, so whatever. So we go down there and fix it and it's, it's shooting perfect right after that. But so being familiar with your equipment definitely helps. Um, how, did you have a good pro shot back where you were? We had, uh, we had Shook's archery, um, which is not, not around anymore. Um, he owned, uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah. There was another range there. Kathy's Creek archery that I went to. It was closer to my house, which was another one I shot at all the time. It was a good pro shop. Um, and some of my long friends still to this day worked there, but I had, um, and my dad worked on my stuff, taught me a lot, but a guy named, uh, Scott Cope really kind of took me under his wing my rookie year. Mm hmm because I didn't know how to do anything but shoot a bow well then. Mm -hmm. Like I still had uh, people building my stuff and helping me. 
but Scott really took me and taught me how to build arrows, how to tune things, why a bow did what it did. Um, mm-hmm. And he worked at a shop, but and he was a very good shooter himself. Um, but yeah, that Scott was the guy that really kind of took me under. And and then we had another shop where we shot winter leagues. It was like an hour away called Jim Hart's. And some of my best memories there, uh, shooting the winter leagues as a kid uh, with Johnny Heath and uh, Stanley and Darla Owen, some legends in our sport. I was lucky to grow up with legends. Mm-hmm. You know, Johnny Heath was the first guy ever to win 100 grand in a year shooting a bow. Mm-hmm. And he was from my hometown. And Stanley and Darley Owen are legends, and they're from my hometown. Like, they mm-hmm. work at the local tire shop in my hometown. <laughs> so it was cool, and I got to be around great greats mm-hmm. my whole life. You know, Johnny used to take me to shoots every weekend, and I'm six, seven years old. Wow. If my dad couldn't go, Johnny's picking me up, and I'm learning from the best in the world at the mm-hmm. time. He was shooting against Ulmer and Hopkins and beating them, you know. And so um, he taught me a lot of mental toughness because he talked trash to a six-year-old, believe it or not. (laughs) But uh, I was lucky in that regard for sure. Yeah. Well, it's the same with me. You know, I mean, with Wayne being growing up together with Wayne and Roy, who Roy was the best hunter and woodsman I've ever been around and the toughest guy I've ever been around. So sometimes, you know, fate deals us a favorable hand Mm -hmm. and we've got good hole cards and then what you do with them is right. I guess up to you, but you know, some of it is just a good lucky break. Yeah. And, uh, we, we definitely are lucky to find something that we love in archery and in bow hunting. Um, I mean, with your, with your brand and your hunting, what, what are your goals? I mean, what's your hunting goals? Well, so about Eight years ago, I started this, like, uh, I wanted to be the youngest to ever do the super slam with a bow. Mm -hmm. And that was right when I would, had like broke the shooter of the year record, because that was a tough transition for me too. You like set this giant goal and it's almost a little bit of a depression when you reach it Mm -hmm. because you're like, man, I've been training for for eight years for that. (laughs) And it's like, it's over. And so I was like, instantly, Samantha was like, no, 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 not any more goals, please. And I was like, I'm going to be the youngest to ever do the super slam with a bow. And so I just went on a war path. Like I was all over North America, um, sheep hunting, you know, mountain goats and musk ox and everything I could find, buffalo, moose, and and um, and I was killing it and found out about this kid named Lincoln Tapp who was like 16 and had like six left. And I'm <laughs> oh, like, oh, you're kidding me. You know? <laughs> and about that time we started, we had our uh, second, third kid and then fourth here recently. And so that's kind of got put on a back burner and I've got mm-hmm. like five left. And Lincoln since then did the super slam by like 18 with a bow. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just like, wow. You know? Yeah. But I really would like to finish that. Mm-hmm. Um, don't know when. Plan on, I got one caribou left, one sheep, one moose, one elk. Um, and so I just need to wrap that up cause it's always in the back of my mind. I don't yeah. like leaving things unfinished. No, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, what, what's been the, I mean, what hunt do you look forward to the most nowadays? Um, with my, with my kids. Yeah. I love hunting with my kids. Like I love to hunt, but I, my son, my oldest Landon killed his first buck with a compound last year at 10 mm. and I got the, I was just. I thought I loved hunting before that. And so like, I look forward, I just hope he loves it and we can do it together. Right. You know, but me personally hunting, I think, um, I got to get back grizzly hunting. Yeah. That was like, man, that was like all time, I think favorite. Did you killed a grizzly? Yeah. I killed a grizzly. Yeah. Where were you? In Alaska. Um, we flew into Unalakleet. Yeah. And, uh, we hunted off boats on the Bering Sea there and, glassed beaches and mm-hmm. gosh it was just an experience like what we, was a hunt we camped um, we were camping on the beach and it was like daylight pretty much the whole time like mm-hmm. it didn't get really dark so we would go out hunting at like seven in the afternoon and hunt all night um and then come back in the morning and because it never got dark right um it would just get dusk almost yeah and so we're like putting out crab pods when we go out um, and then when we come back in from hunting, we're pulling them up, these crabs, we're robbing these islands of, of seagull eggs and sea ducks. And we're making these crab omelets for breakfast on the side of the sea, <laughs> taking a nap in a tent, hunting grizzlies and stalking into That's 20 yards. Life. I mean, it was the most unbelievable week. And, um, I've just, ever since I did it, me and Micah were up there just like sitting on the ocean, watching the waves come in, like 
whales breaching out and it was just like are you kidding me like we get to yeah we get to be here right now right and uh, we seen like 35 grizzlies in seven days it was just an unbelievable experience and i've wanted to get back ever since so what was i mean what'd you kill i shot a decent grizzly um but it was uh, one of those deals where um and those guys john wilson was my the guy that was with me and his son um it was one of those deals where they got charged the week before and had a real sketchy situation. And so it was one of those deals where like, when I shoot and they're, cause I'm hunting with a bow and mm-hmm. they're like, Hey, you just be honest with me. If you're not comfortable with it, we're putting them down with a gun, you yeah. know, which negates it for the super slam. Yeah. Um, it doesn't count for me. It's my bear, but it doesn't count mm-hmm. for that stuff. And so I'm like, man, I, I really want to do this right. So it was like day seven and I'd passed a ton of bears cause he's like, we can do better. Yeah. We can do better. And I'm mm-hmm. like, that one's fine. <laughs> yeah. We can do better. I'm like, all right. Yeah. I don't know bear. Yeah. And so finally this, this big bear is coming down the, the beach and I'm like 20 yards off the water and he's between me and the water. So it's going to be like, 10 yards yeah. you know and i'm like gosh this is so awesome my heart's beating out of my chest mm-hmm. this a grizzly walking at me we never show it's like we're around this little rock he doesn't come so i peek up he's walking the other way and so i'm trying to range him and i the grass is blowing in the wind and it's telling me he's 12 yards mm-hmm. he's obviously way further than that so i just kind of guessed at the distance and i was like 40 mm-hmm. looks 40 yards so i put my 40 in him and he was like 35 mm. So when I hit him, I hit him right through the top of the lungs. Mm -hmm. But to me, in my mind, I was like, that looked high. And John's like, where'd you hit him? I said, high and instantly. And he's, you know, it's over. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, it was Mm -hmm. like, and because I'm like second guessing. Yeah. Was it high? But I, you know, once you touch those animals, it's yours. I didn't want him to run off and never get him. Right. And so we got up to him, ended up, I had hit him like top lungs. um, But. Wouldn't have went anywhere. You know. Yeah. it, It was like. At that moment, I was kind of mad, but at the same time, very thankful to be there and, yeah. and have had that experience, but knew I was like, that's a good excuse to come back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, you definitely need to get back in there and, yeah, make that happen. There is nothing like, I mean, I love those big bear. Yeah. I love big, I love, for, for whatever reason, the buff, you know, Cape buffalo, water buffalo, grizzly, brown bear. I love that stuff. It's like something that can kill you back. I love it. <laughs> I mean, it feels like you just got to be so, like, in a higher, like, uh, I don't know, just be at, at your very best yeah. to get it done. And there's something beautiful about that. For sure. It was like a seven-day adrenaline rush mm-hmm. where, like, elk is its own beast, and it's so yeah. much fun. White tail the same. Sheep is, like, the coolest country, very technical hunt. But that grizzly or something that can kill you and will kill you, mm-hmm. it's like you have you can't let your guard down at any time, and and like your life depends upon it. And it was, uh, I loved it though. It was yeah. just like that feeling every day. You're on that boat, and you spot one, and you're getting off the boat, and it's like hand to hand combat with this thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it sounds amazing. Yeah, have you done that? <laughs> I've done grizzly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a but similar type of thing. Yeah. I mean, and I don't want to. You know, it's crazy. It's like if some, somebody heard these two stories, they might, my story and your story, they might think, well, is a bow the best weapon for, to kill yeah. grizzly then? Because we both had it a little bit tainted with the rifle. Yeah. And uh, no, a bow is, I think, the most lethal way yeah. because many times animal, they don't even know what happened, right? right? So it's, it's, a, it's, you know, if there's a, a beautiful death, you know, that'd be a weird way to term it, but... It feels like it to me yeah. because it's not like the damage and the shock and the noise right. and the frantic whatever. And the animal knows something happened because many times they don't know. The yeah. arrow, you know, if you cut if you cut yourself, sometimes you don't even feel the cut, mm-hmm. and then you just look like you cut your leg yeah. on that one hunt, and it's like you you don't you don't feel the pain. So that's kind of what an arrow is like going through these animals. They don't yeah. really. No. It's just like you cut yourself with something super sharp. You don't necessarily feel it, but they don't feel it all of a sudden they lose blood pressure they pass out they're dead so to me that's the perfect death right if something's going to die right right? um so yeah i think i think archery is you know you know definitely can get the job done on these animals yeah we've had you know grizzlies its own special beast because even on my hunt the year prior one of the guides got torn up by a Mm -hmm. a wounded grizzly so that makes you know that's in the back of everybody's right. head 
and just like your situation they had it the week before but yeah i don't want anybody to think that an arrow can't get it done because i've seen arrows kill animals giant animals i've killed a you know that bear right there was a giant uh brown bear and it was down in seconds yeah after one perfect arrow oh i think it's it's a way more lethal way mm -hmm. you know like my moose have all died within seconds and they're giant animals mm -hmm. it's just i think what the deal is it's like Hey, everybody's life's at stake here. Yeah. So if it's not absolutely perfect, double lung, top of the heart type shot, these guys are putting it down. Yeah. Um, because nobody wants to have that call on a sat phone and then sitting there bleeding to death on the beach, right? Right. But I mean, I've watched shoot deer and everything that the arrow blows through them so fast and they just hop over there, like look around. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what happened. They're obviously not in pain. And then all of a sudden they just fall over. Right. Or with a gun. It's Everybody like, knows what happened. I mean, it's a it's not a very easy thing to be a part of right. sometimes because it's like shock and loud and the animals freaking out. Yeah. So archery is very way more intimate and silent. Mm -hmm. Me and Micah had that like a little experience last year. Where we both kind of looked at each other like that was the most insane thing ever. It was in Nebraska and the real quiet morning on a creek bottom and this buck just big old velvet tin comes walking up out of the, the sand. And the arrow, when I shot him, it was the quietest, like he didn't hear it. We didn't hardly hear it. The arrow blew through him, stuck in the sand. And it was like just this slow death of like mm -hmm. me and Michael were like nothing around us even knew we were there. The deer right. were still feeding around us. And it's just a way cooler experience. And mm -hmm. I mean, if you, and nature is brutal. Yeah. These animals are going to die. Right. Right. And it's the best in my opinion, shooting an old, mature animal before he suffers and starves to death because he doesn't have teeth. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it is the way to do it because then we get to honor that animal and share him and eat him and, you know, we get to tell stories about him forever and instead of him rotting in a ditch somewhere and coyotes yeah. eating him alive. Right. Because I've watched that. Yeah. You know, and it people want to it think works. it's like, the you know, these bucks have families and they go back to their little bambies and it's not the way nature works. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's brutal. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, it, and hunting is no matter how you do it, there's, it's not perfect all the time. No. And death sometimes goes, it's, you know, life and death and things want to live. And, you know, sometimes it's a struggle. Yeah. But many times with that perfect arrow, it's not. Yeah. It's just over. And that's, that's what we strive for. Um, so, when you compare your tournaments to hunting, what tell me about the difference between that those two? Because there's there's huge challenges in both. Right. Where do you where do you see the difference? So I guess in that final moment, I, I, they're very similar in how you handle that. I think and very the pressure. Different. Yeah, the pressure. Um, the difference for me is in a tournament, it's a controlled environment. I know the time I have on the clock. We're still timed, but I know the time. Mm -hmm. Like I know I have this much. The target's not going anywhere. You know, it's not looking at me. So inside, I'm not rushing. You know, it's a system of I can. I know what I have time to do. Glass, pick my spot, fix my footing, make a good shot, and mentally prepare for that. Hunting can be everything. You can have that, or like we talked about today, a buck can stand up out of his bed and look at you, and you got eight seconds to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so, in those moments when everything inside of you is screaming for you to hurry, I think where is where a lot of people screw up. Um, and so that's kind of how they're different for me. Is like hunting; you just face with so many different scenarios, um, frantic things that make you almost. Um, your chances of success go way down in those those moments because i mean of course everybody wants the 20 yard shot broadside him looking the other way yeah. feeding right mm -hmm. just doesn't happen a lot in bow hunting mm -hmm. and so you have to be able to adapt to a lot of different situations in bow hunting where i think in the tournament world i know the situations i could be put in out there you know the wind could be blowing yeah but um i still have time to figure out where my aim needs to be and all that stuff where I think they're similar is when you hit full draw and it's time to execute a perfect shot and everything is riding on that arrow. And I think that's where tournaments have taught me a ton where I've learned and failed so many times in those moments. And I feel like what I've always tried to do is you can't replicate that feeling. 
uh, when your heart rates up and you're just uh, you're nervous and you know if you don't make a good shot, like what's riding on that could be an animal of a lifetime, could be a world championship, like that feeling you can't replicate. There's no way to practice it. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the only time I ever had time to learn were in those moments in my mind. It's like when I'm here, even if I'm sucking right now, like if I feel like I can't win, let's learn. Like how, what can I do different to make this moment easier or, or make this moment where I can come out on top next time? Yeah. And so in the tournament world, I've learned what I do wrong in those moments. When I start to feel that panic inside, like my pen's not sitting still. Um, and I mean, just br- brutal truth. When you're nervous and your heart rate's up, your pen is like, mm-hmm. you know, and you have to learn to execute through that and make a good shot. And so that's where it's very similar. When I pull back on a giant bull, he sc- just screamed in my face. And I, you know, I know I got five seconds to make a perfect shot or it's all over and I won't get another opportunity. Mm-hmm. It's very similar in that aspect um, of how you execute in that moment. Yeah. I'm, yeah, that's interesting. So what do you, I know what I focus on, but when you think of hunting or your tournaments, do you think of those money shots you've made or the ones you've screwed up? Oh, no, the ones I've screwed up. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I think we talked about uh, one of my screw-ups today more than anything. I was showing you pictures, and I'm like, but that's the ones that's always eat at me, Mm -hmm. you know. And I've even, I think we said that earlier, it's like winning used to be this huge high. Yeah. You know, um, early when I was trying to make a name and I was still trying to prove to myself even that I had what it took. It was this huge high that didn't go away for days. And now it's not that way anymore. It's still a great feeling to come out on top. But losing and like doing something stupid that causes you to fail still Mm -hmm. hurts just as bad as it ever did. Yeah. And um, so I remember those shots. Yeah. You know, the ones that I'm like, oh, that cost me big time. And I sh- that was could have been prevented. Yeah. Right? Even hunting, shooting tournaments, it's the ones that. But I think it's a good thing because you learn and you remember what you did and how you failed there. And, like, I, you don't want to feel that again. Yeah, I wonder if there's something. Because I, so it's weird because we think about when we failed mm-hmm. and how bad it hurt. Right. Just like. When I look through comments on the page, I don't, oh, good job, great, love what you do, love you. Wait, what? You know, this hate one? Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> so, so why are we drawn to the, why are we fueled by this negativity or this fail? It Does it make you just want to work harder so you don't, because you don't want to feel that again, I wonder? Yeah, maybe. I, you know, it's funny because everybody's always like, you got to forget about the, you got to forget about the mistake and move on. Yeah. And I'm like, I, once I figured out I couldn't, I realized like, no, I just got to figure out how to go. I made a mistake, but still keep the confidence to go next time I'm going to crush them, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that's what, and like doing the podcast at home and talking to some of these guys about that, that's really the difference. It's not that they go, I can totally forget that I struck out the last time or the last four at bats. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that I can still have the confidence to know I put in the work to walk up here and I'm going to hit a home run this time, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think that's been more the difference. I don't know why we're drawn to that because I'm the same way. <laughs> so some things I've quit trying to figure out and I've just accepted that. Just the way it goes. Yeah. I'm going to remember the bad ones, Yeah, but I still want to be able to be like, I'm going to get the next one. Yeah. So. Yeah. Just know that, have that confidence that you put in the work yeah. that, yeah, I may have failed this time, mm-hmm. but that's not going to define me. Yeah. Yeah, it's um. So in regard to failure, I want to know how can I get to be a better shot. You're great, honest to God. I, I put it on my Instagram today. I said for everybody wondering, Cam could shoot. Mm-hmm. You know, because everybody sees on Instagram, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can edit things. You never know what you're gonna find, right? But you really have a good shot. I mean, it's something you've been obsessed with too. Mm-hmm. You know, and when you love something, you're gonna be good at it, and you are. Honestly, man, I know Wayne was kind of giving you a hard time about putting your thumb behind your (laughs) neck, you know, which I used to do as a kid, all those things and, you know, shooting a trigger. And, but honestly, man, it's like repetition is key Mm -hmm. and just coming back tomorrow and doing it again. I I think I told you, you know, I got some hate the other day because my kid's shooting, he's drawing high. 
I thought in. he was shooting good. I yeah. was like, this kid can shoot. Yeah. I didn't see any of the, I didn't read any comments, <laughs> but I saw the video and I was like, God dang. Yeah, he can shoot. He, I mean, he's got it, but he's already told me like, dad, I'm never shooting tournaments. And I'm like, okay, it's fine. We're just hunting. But I'm trying to teach him what I know, you know, as a dad, that's kind of something you want to do, right? You like, this is what I know. Yeah. I, want, I want you to at least know this and have it. And so we're out there and, and, um, he's drawing high and settling in and, Everybody's like, oh, he's sky drawing. He's got to, you got to teach him to stop. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't have to do that. Yeah. He's not shooting tournaments. <laughs> he's not going to get docked points for sky drawing. And so today, like the one thing I said to watching you shoot, you draw kind of at the target mm -hmm. and like raise up. But yeah. you said you come above it and then back down. Mm -hmm. For me, if I don't know that I could do that because I'm trying to set all my muscles as I'm drawing and get that shoulder pushed out mm -hmm. and then kind of I'm, slowly into the target as, as I come to my click and start the process. Um, now hunting, obviously you get put in so many different scenarios, which is what you do. So like our worlds are a little different Yeah, like tournaments. It's like, yeah, I can do the same thing every time. If a bull's looking at me, I'm not going to be like, mm, mm, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. I'm going to be like trying to like right. little as movement as possible. So like, yeah, I mean, obviously drawing at the target is ideal for a hunting scenario, mm -hmm. which is what you do. So I'm not going to tell you, you should change that. For me in the tournament world, I need to draw high and settle yeah. in um, because I'm trying to set those. And then we're trying to hit something this big, not lungs or heart. Or, mm -hmm. And so, um, but again, we were talking about form earlier, what's right, what's wrong. I used to think like, this is the way you got to do it. Mm -hmm. But then you get beat by guys doing it, what you would say the wrong way, so many times. Rio Wild, leaning back, string across the chest, face pressure. I'm like, this, no way this guy's beat me. And he just throttle you, you know. <laughs> and like guys with face pressure and anchoring here. Yeah. You're like, what is this guy? No way. And it just can't miss. Yeah. And you're like, okay. It's more about doing the same thing every time mm -hmm. than it is he's got bad form. He's, right. And then punching the trigger. Wrong way to do it. Well, you tell Kyle Douglas or Gillingham or some of those guys that they're incredible at it. I could never do it. Mm -hmm. I don't have the mind for it. So it's funny. Archery is just one of those deals where I don't tell a lot of people they're doing it wrong. You know, I've never been that way because I'm like, if that's the way you want to do it, you just have to be great at that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's ways that are easier to repeat. Mm -hmm. And that's archery. If you can repeat it, you can be good at it. Yeah. So I think things make it way harder than it should be. Mm -hmm. Form problems, you know, too short a draw. Draw length is a big. It's, yeah. it's really hard to be repeat shot after shot if your draw length isn't right, stuff like that. But I didn't see anything today that really I was like, it's really hindering you from being a great shot because you were a great shot, mm. you know. Thank you. I, is there anything with, you know, that trigger? I mean, was I do? Did you notice anything? I wasn't watching trigger oh, finger okay. stuff. I was watching impact. But um, are you a trigger puncher? <laughs> what, Is that what Wayne uh, says? That's what Dudley says. <laughs> <laughs> well then, um, yeah. So it must be true. It must be true. Um, I would say, you know what? Five years ago, I'd say you probably should stop. <laughs> Now I've been I'm beat, too old. Uh, yeah, I've been beat by too many people doing it. Oh, okay. You know, and if you can, the main thing is controlling it. Mm -hmm. Like if you're trying to get above the target, drop in and punch. That's like target panic. That yeah. is like de like debilitate. Like you can't perform mm -hmm. like that, right? To a really high level. But like if you're able to put your pin there, and when it gets dead center, you can just oof, yeah touch it off. That's the most accurate way to shoot. And I I know like everybody's gonna hate me for saying that from, mm -hmm. but like you watch those guys that are good at doing it the kyle douglas's the tim gillingham at times remington boyers at times jimmy lutz those guys when they are on are unbeatable mm -hmm. the problem is when they're not and their timing's just off yeah you know that's when the hinge guys like me or justin hannah's that that really wait and just are patient and boom let it flow let the bow mm -hmm. shoot itself nathan brooks like we were watching on that poster a, yeah. like jesse brought just easy pure shooters mm -hmm. that's when they they take over um but in the wind and stuff like that punchers always win <laughs> yeah and it's frustrating mm -hmm. and i room with a guy named justin hannah one of my best friends and we're just like 
freaking punchers, man. <laughs> so we're looking at the weather. Yeah. It's going to be blowing 20 today. God, freaking punchers are going to win today, man. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, where I, when I miss, I mean, I know where, you know, my arrow's hitting where the pin is, yeah. right? But when I miss, it's when I don't, and when I'm hunting, here's what I think of, keep that pin there. Yeah. So if I keep the pin there and punch or do whatever I do, right. I'm going to hit wherever that mm -hmm. was. If I drop, or if it's moving or like coming off or doing, it's going to go wherever that ended yeah. up. So if I keep the pin there, even like today shooting, if the pin was staying there and I hit, that's exactly where yeah. that arrow hit. Yeah. So if I just keep the pin there, that's mm -hmm. the key. And I, and I shoot, you know, I shot a thumb button a lot this year. I won the worlds with a thumb button. So it wasn't a hinge mm. and it's set really, really light. Like you can shake it and it'll fire. And so I shoot it on, it's not a punch, but it's a controlled shot. I'm not sitting there just waiting, waiting, waiting. But the problem is once my mind, I call it a demon. Once that demon crawls up my leg and gets on me and I have to punch it, mm -hmm. then I have to set it down. Mm. Like if I draw back and aim and cannot squeeze yeah. cannot execute a good shot that's when i'm like nope like because that can get to the point of not can't get my pin in the middle it can turn really bad because i've had target panic to the point where i thought about quitting mm -hmm. you know and i see a lot of people there so i then i put it down pick up my hinge and just roll with that weight patient you have to be patient with a hinge mm -hmm. um but no i i think if you can command the trigger and keep your pin in the middle it's a very accurate way to shoot mm. And the important thing is, like you said, burning that pin through the middle, yeah. right? And not giving up on it. Because most people, from the time they think punch, yeah, their brain thinks it to their finger actually doing it, their pin moves, yeah, right? And that's where they're getting that wiggle fire. But if you can burn that pin through that target and doof, touch it off, it's a it's a deadly way to shoot. Yeah, well. Yeah, Joel I, Turner just passed out listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. If you took away all my trigger punch and kills, this room would be empty. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, then, I mean, I think that answers the question because there's a bunch of big stuff in here. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I hope they still count. Well, I think there's just more ways than one to do it. <laughs> they still count for sure. <laughs> well, Levi, I mean, oh my gosh, I'm so pumped. I'm so pumped we spent the date day together i'm i want you you know the success you've had is just like it, as i said is it's inspiring to me but i just want you to have more i want this brand to blow up i want people to get into the mindset the, the manimal mindset that's taking you to the top um and i want i just wish nothing but success for you and i'm so thankful for this gift i'm thankful for your time uh this has been a great day and and you know if this trip caps off with you killing a big bull with the born and raised guys here yeah. this weekend, then man, nobody's going to be happier than me, man. It's been, it's been my pleasure. Honestly, I'm a huge fan of what you do. Thankful for what you've done for what we both love bow hunting. Um, and the day had couldn't have went any better in my opinion. I, I loved every minute of it and hope to do it again sometime. So, all right, guys, we'll follow Levi Morgan, learn from him. And thank you. Keep hammering. Guys, it's Cameron Haynes here. I want you to win this brand new 2023 Ford Raptor. The tax man loves coming for that money, right? I'm giving away 10,000 cash to offset that for the winner. Enter to win, CameronHaynes.com. Keep hammering. my pace i am roy tough i am the change the fuel endure feeling like cam haynes